you guys. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Renee Brethorst, and I'm the interim director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation. Tonight, I am honored to welcome the sole surviving battle of Iwo Jima's Medal of Honor recipient, Herschel Woody Williams, as well as museum historian, Dr. Mark DePew. Thank you both for being here. Many of tonight's attendees are our founding donors and annual supporters. Each of you have helped us realize the vision for this museum and library that tells the inspirational story of our nation's 16th president to visitors across the globe and for what we are truly grateful. I would also like to offer my sincere thanks to our generous event sponsors, Julie and Bill Salini, Ray and Judy McCaskey, Paul and Mary Jovovich, Personal Mobility, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the UPS Foundation. In addition to our generous donors, I would also like to thank the staff of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum for their ongoing partnership and preparation for this event. Now, before I welcome our state historian, Dr. Sam Wheeler, up to the stage, I would like to introduce Patrick O'Leary. Pat is a member of the Herschel Woody Williams Board and a retired UPS Veterans Affair Manager and is here this evening to introduce a very short film presented by the UPS Foundation. Pat. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to share this amazing story about solving a 72-year-old mystery for a very special American and a fellow Marine. I've known Woody for about 10 years and I've served on the board of his foundation for about three. In 2017, I was part of a group that was planning events connected to the christening of a US Navy ship named Four Woody. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing four is because occasionally I say after Woody and he corrects me because in order to name something after him, he would have to be dead. And, <laughs> and as you'll see tonight, Woody is not dead. Uh, during that process, it occurred to me that we would be with just in a few miles of the base where Woody attended boot camp, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, San Diego. I thought it would be fun if we could just take Woody back to boot camp. After reviewing my idea with Woody's family, they agreed, so I started to work on planning uh, Woody's return to Marine Corps Recruit Training. One of his grandsons sent me a series of documents that I was using to determine the dates that Woody's, of, of Woody's training. Included in those documents, were the statements from the Marines who witnessed the bravery that earned him the Medal of Honor. Over the years, I've heard Woody speak many times and recount that day on Iwo Jima. And one of the things that always stuck in my mind was the part of the story where he would talk about the four Marines that were providing him cover fire, but two of those Marines were killed and he never knew their names. So it got to a point that so anyway, so as I read through the documents, I noticed that all the Marines that had provided statements were in the same unit. Again, Woody would talk about those. He would hold his medal. I'm the caretaker of this medal. I wear it in the honor of these two Marines that he never knew their names. So after the witness statements and realizing that all five of the witness statements were in the same unit, it occurred to me maybe the two Marines were. So at this point, I'm gonna let the video finish telling the story. But I will add, the video was produced by UPS and it was used as our Veterans Day video in 2017 and it actually is posted on YouTube. Uh, I worked for UPS for 40 years and the last seven of it, I was the Corporate Veterans Affairs Manager. So, please play the video. First of all, I was a farm boy and I became a Marine primarily because of the uniform. I knew nothing about the Marine Corps. I knew nothing about the armed forces. I knew nothing about war. But after boot camp, then they told us we were going to the South Pacific and we would be involved in war. Corporal Herschel Woody Williams and over 70,000 Marines were fighting an enemy force that used caves, underground tunnels, and fortified concrete bunkers called pillboxes to defend the island. 
On February 23, 1945, days into the battle, Woody, with four Marine riflemen providing cover, used six flamethrowers to eliminate seven enemy pillboxes, allowing Marines to advance and secure a nearby airfield. We had no organization. We were just a group of Marines trying to move forward. Uh, who you were, what outfit you occupied, it wasn't important. And when I picked these four guys, to, four Marines, to support me, I had no idea who they were. Two of those were, were killed that day, uh, protecting me. Woody for his valiant devotion to duty and service above self, was awarded the Medal of Honor. I have said over and over many, many times that this medal that I wear, I wear in their honor, not mine. So I've considered myself as a caretaker of the medal, not the owner of the medal. For 72 years, Woody did not know the names of these two Marines. But thanks to Woody's friend and fellow Marine, UPSer Pat O'Leary, that was about to change. A couple months ago, when we were planning this trip to go to San Diego because they've named a ship for Woody, one of his grandsons had sent me a series of documents to help put together some background information. And those, some of those documents were the witness statements. To get the Medal of Honor, you have to have at least five witness statements. So as I started to flip through these witness statements, what occurred to me is every one of them were in the same unit. Pat quickly realized that the two men killed in action were from that same unit. So he reached out to other Marines for help. And they accessed the casualty list, and we found two Marines that were killed that day, and it fit. They were both young enlisted, PFC and a corporal. It all fit. It, it has to be those two Marines. It's just no doubt in our mind. On October 21st, 2017, at Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego, a plaque was unveiled, revealing the names of the two fallen Marines. After 72 years, Woody finally had an answer. It was a very emotional moment. Uh, I almost lost it, because I had no idea that First of all, that anybody had been working to find out who they were. And second of all, now that I know who they were, that gives me kind of a closure that I couldn't have had before because I didn't know their names. All I could do is just continue to say, two Marines who sacrificed their life. Now I can say, Two Marines by the name of Corporal Warren H. Bornholz, Private First Class Charles G. Fisher. When somebody sacrifices their life for another individual, I feel it has uh, an impact that's never been experienced before. It absolutely changed my life completely. That I was able to provide a little comfort to this, again, this guy who stood tall in the middle of hell. That's what Marines do. We take care of each other. Good evening. My name is Dr. Samuel Wheeler. I'm the state historian of Illinois. It's wonderful to see so many of you here tonight. I want to thank the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation for bringing us all together. On nights like this, I really feel fortunate to be part of this institution. Events like this one don't simply give us a time to reflect on the past. I hope they also offer us context to deal with our present struggles and help us as we chart new paths into the future. Today, we are as close to the World War II generation as Abraham Lincoln was 
to the Revolutionary War generation. For Lincoln and his contemporaries, the Revolutionary War generation was truly their greatest generation. In February 1861, while on his way to Washington to take the oath of office, Lincoln spoke in Trenton, New Jersey. He recalled reading a book about George Washington as a young boy, and he was struck by the description of the hardships General Washington and his soldiers went through during the Battle of Trenton. I recollect thinking then that there must have been something more than common that those men struggled for, Lincoln told his audience. The next day, Lincoln spoke in Independence Hall at Philadelphia. He told his audience that he, quote, never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln referenced the Revolutionary War generation during some of his most well-known speeches. At the end of his first inaugural, for example, Lincoln pled with Southerners to consult the better angels of their nature and recall the North and South shared history, or as he so poetically called it, the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave. He was asking Northerners and Southerners to remember their grandfathers who fought shoulder to shoulder during the revolution to create the nation. And finally, in the middle of the Civil War, Lincoln again referenced the Revolutionary War generation in the opening sentences of the Gettysburg Address, when he praised them for creating a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the revolutionary idea that all men are created equal. To Abraham Lincoln and his contemporaries, those men who fought and died in the Revolutionary War were the greatest generation. And this evening, we are so fortunate to be joined by a member of our greatest generation. Herschel Woody Williams was born on a dairy farm in 1923 in West Virginia. He enlisted in the US Marine Corps and served in the Battle of Iwo Jima. During the battle, Mr. Williams displayed valiant devotion to duty and service above self as he enabled his company to reach its objective. On October 5, 1945, Mr. Williams received the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Harry Truman in the White House. Today, Mr. Williams is the sole surviving Marine from World War II to wear the Medal of Honor. Today, Mr. Williams remains devoted to veterans and their families. His foundation, uh, allows him to serve gold star families who've lost their loved ones. To date, Mr. Williams and his foundation have established 59 gold star families memorial monuments across the country with more than 60 additional monuments underway in 43 states. Tonight, Dr. Mark DePew, a West Point graduate, a retired member of our armed forces and the founding director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum Oral History Program has the honor of sharing the stage with Mr. Williams. Dr. DePew and Mr. Williams will have a discussion that I'm sure will bridge the past with the present. I'm excited, and I hope you are too, to eavesdrop on their conversation. This is a conversation between one of ALPLM's finest historians and one of the most remarkable members of America's greatest generation. Please welcome Dr. Mark DePew and Herschel Woody Williams. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Well, Woody, I guess the audience gets to eavesdrop on our conversation here. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you all for coming here. Uh, I'm going to start with this question for you, Woody. All right. What do you think of the museum today? Outstanding. Is there a better word? Maybe it's awesome. We're using the word awesome today in, in many languages and, or in our language. So I'll, I'll say it was awesome. 
and I want to point out, I'm sure there's lots of the volunteers that are the lifeblood of this institution that are sitting in the audience today. So uh, you can thank them for making sure that this place is running and, and meets the public in the best of terms and does an outstanding job here as well. So thank all of you. Yes. But let's get right to the issue at hand. Just a very brief uh, background on Iwo Jima. I think most of the people know most of the details here. 10 square miles. In fact, I don't even think it was that large. I think it was eight. Yeah, it's just a spit of a land. That's what I get for looking at the Library of Congress version of it, I guess. <laughs> um, volcanic sand probably had the stink of sulfur. I'm sure you noticed that while you were there. 26,000 casualties for the Americans, 6,800 died there. Um, and that was in large part, and I know you're gonna go into this, but the Japanese had changed the tactics by that time. Oh. And no longer were they gonna meet you at the beaches. They are gonna wait until you came to them and dug in, and they'd had months, practically a year or more, to do that. So 6,800 of your fellow Marines died there 19,000 casualties on the Japanese side, and only 216 of those were prisoners of war. Correct. That tells you something about the commitment that they had. But I wanted to start with this. I always start with the basic question, when and where were you born? I was born in a little community called Quiet Dell. I think it was misnamed. But it was called Quiet Dell, West Virginia, about seven and a half miles from Fairmont, West Virginia, which we call our hometown. But it was in the country, and I was uh, born uh, in an area where farming and coal mining were the only two occupations that we had in the community. And my father, uh, when I was about five, four or five years old, started a dairy farm, and I was raised on a dairy farm. How long have you been called Woody? I got that when I was in my uh, teen years. Uh, we had a, a fellow on the radio. We didn't have a television back then, of course. But we had a fellow on the radio by the name of Starcher, and his first name was Woody. And I wanted to emulate him because he, was, he had a beautiful voice, he played the guitar and sang. And I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. So. Uh, I had a cousin that taught me how the basic chords of a guitar, so I did, tried that. I started singing and playing the guitar, but I didn't make any, any history in it. So <laughs> that didn't last very long, but from that, trying to be Woody Starcher, I got the name Woody. Well, it fits you well, I have to say. Well, of course, Woody comes from Woodrow, and my dad was a a fan and a believer in Woodrow Wilson, and that's, I think, had a significance on Woodrow. My first name was Herschel, and my mother, I, there were 11 in the family, I think mom ran out of names, so she <laughs> named me after the doctor. <laughs> Does that mean you came at the tail end of this, 11? I was the runt of the litter. <laughs> okay. And I'm always interested in talking to your generation, because it's not just the World War II generation, it's the Great Depression generation. So maybe just spend a minute or two talking about what it was like growing up on the farm during the Great Depression. Well, you either raised it or made it or you didn't have it. <laughs> that was basically because there were no, no stores except in town and automobiles uh, practically didn't exist. We did have on the farm <clears throat> a first, a Model T Ford that we would deliver milk, butter, eggs, and produce to town. And that's how really we supported ourselves on the farm, money-wise. <clears throat> so every morning, we would load the pickup and go the seven and a half miles to town, and we had customers in town. We'd deliver milk or whatever they would want to each house. <clears throat> and uh, we'd, before I started the school, <clears throat> that, that was part of our routine every morning. And, <clears throat> of course, during the school times, when school took up, well, then uh, 
my father and brothers would have to do that. Uh, the uh, older brothers didn't, didn't go to school. They went to the first few grades and then they quit. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we finally promoted or got promoted in the automobile from a Model T to a Model A. When the Model A's came out, my dad was able to get one of those, which was a more uh, modern automobile. But that's how we made our living. And uh, during all my teen, all my preteen and teen years, that's that's what we did. We're just a few days away from December seventh, and I'm sure you remember December seventh, nineteen forty-one. You were a teenager at the time, correct? I was. I was seventeen years old. What do you remember about that day? Well, <clears throat> I have to back up a little bit because I had a the brother next to me somehow learned that there was an outfit called Civilian Conservation Corps, and we called it the Three C's, or they did anyway. So when he reached his 16th uh, age, why, you could join the Three C's at 16, and he did. So he went to the CCC camp, which was about 80 miles from our home, and I'm still not old enough. I'm still under 16. So uh, he would get home once in a while. He'd thumb home from the camp on Friday evening and thumb back on Sunday afternoon. And uh, when he came home, he would have, he would have dollar bills. Why, well, I never saw a dollar bill. <laughs> Nickel or a dime, that, that was big money. You know? So uh, I decided when I get 16, I'm going to do the same thing. And my mother was totally unhappy with both of us, but... Uh, when I reached 16, I joined, thinking I would go to the very same camp that he was in, which was in a little community called Pickens, West Virginia. But I didn't know they had other camps. I thought that was the only one West Virginia had. But I found out later that they had a lot of them. So they sent me to Morgantown, West Virginia, to another camp. And there I joined people from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, and Virginia, and there were about 265 of us in that camp. And I'm 16 years old, of course. So <clears throat> uh, we're there for a few months, and then they put us on a train, everybody, and shipped us all the way to Montana, to a little town called Whitehall, Montana. Uh, it only had two buildings. It had a, 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 a hardware store where they kept you could buy anything at the hardware store. It had a porch around the place, and it was always loaded with wheelbarrows and rakes and hoes and axes or whatever you needed in the way of utilities. And then across the road, and it wasn't a street because it was just a dirt, dirt piece of ground between the two buildings, was a saloon. And the saloon, well, that's where the cattlemen and the sheepmen went to have their Saturday night who laws? <laughs> so, and sheepmen and cattlemen did not get along. They still don't, but at that time it was worse, I think. But uh, some of us would sneak over there on Saturday night and sit on the porch of the hardware store, We're just waiting, because we knew sooner or later there are going to be some people bust out of those bat wing doors <laughs> and we're going to have a big fight. That, that was our Saturday night entertainment. If they, <laughs> We're terribly disappointed if they didn't fight. Yeah. But we're only 16 and 17, so we can't get in the saloon. You had to be 21 in order to be able to go in the saloon. Uh, eventually, some of us got up enough nerve to go ask the proprietor if we could look inside. And we did. We went in, and of course, they had bars on both sides of the building. And they had a brass rail at the foot, which you stand there with your feet on it, you know. And... Uh, the uh, spit tune at the end of every end of every bar, and we just got to see it. But uh, when Pearl Harbor happened, when, uh, they called us out the next morning and got us into formation and told us that America was going to war. None of us had ever heard of Pearl Harbor. None of us, most of us, I'm sure, didn't even know we had a Pacific Ocean at that point in time. 
And uh, they gave us two options. The CCC camps were run by the Army. Mm -hmm. we, had a, we had a commanding officer, we had a first sergeant, mess sergeant, and then some clerks in the office that did the office work. And they were Army people. So they gave us two options, that if we were over 18 years old, we could go directly into the Army. They would enlist us, and off we go to the arm, regular Army. But if you're under that, then you had to have parent consent. And I'm only 17. I'd passed my 17th birthday, but I wasn't 18, so I couldn't go. I probably would have, had I been over 18 years old, I probably would have become an Army guy. Boy, that's a horrible thought. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I have a different opinion about that, of course. <laughs> Figured you did. But uh, the other option was you could go home uh, because the CCCs were going to be discontinued. They are going to do away with them. Yeah. So I went home, and I'm still 17, and I want my mom. My father died when I was 11. I wanted my mom to sign a paper saying I could go in the Marine Corps at 17, and she would not do it. She's still trying to run this farm. So she said, basically, I need you here more than they need you, so she wouldn't sign the paper. So I had to wait until I was 18. I uh, went to bed one night. Woke up the next morning, and I went from a boy to a man. Now I can go without mom's consent. I don't need mom's approval. So I went into the city, into Fairmont, to enlist in the Marine Corps. I've been asked many times, why did you select the Marine Corps? Well, I'll tell you why I selected the Marine Corps. I had two brothers that had already been drafted. And one of them was in Maryland, the other one was in Ohio, at Army bases. And every once in a while, they would thumb home on Friday night and back on Sunday, and they had, would wear their Army uniform. That was the ugliest thing in town. <laughs> I did not want that Army uniform. It was an old wool, brown, horrible-looking thing. Well, that's why Eisenhower and, changed the jacket, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but then we had a Marine, or an individual who joined the Marine Corps, and he would come home on his 30-day furlough, and only got one a year. One 30-day furlough a year. He would come home, and he had to wear his Marine uniform all the time he was home, his dress blues. And he could take the girls away from us. <laughs> I thought, buddy, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so I wanted to be a Marine. <laughs> and the first one I went in to enlist, I filled out the paper, handed it to the Marine, the recruiter, and... He didn't even look at my paper, he just looked at me and he said, I can't take you. And I said, why? And he said, you are too short. Of course, I didn't ask him why, but that, that was the decision he made and I went on back home. How tall back. were you at the time? Huh? How tall? I was five foot six, but you had to be five foot eight or better. So that was in late 42 and uh, in early 43, the Marine Corps took the height requirement off and lowered it so they would take shorter people. And so I went back to enlist again. And went back, I can't remember whether it was the same recruiter or not. That memory won't return. But anyway, I filled out the paper to give to the recruiter. And there was, I don't remember the first form. Well, if, if the block was on there, I don't remember it, but there was a block on the second form that said religion. That's all it had, just a square block and it said religion. You were supposed to put whatever in there. And uh, I do remember he said if every block or every part of this form is not completed, it won't be accepted. So I didn't know what to put in there. I didn't have any religion. Uh, we, didn't have any, we didn't even have a church in the community. So I didn't know we had Episcopalians and Episcopalians and Methodists and Baptists. And all. <laughs> I didn't know any of that. So I didn't know what to put in there. And I'm standing right beside a little Italian boy that was even shorter than I was. <laughs> but it, when they lowered the height requirement, it went down to 5'2 or better. So he was a little short fellow. And I'm standing right beside him or behind him. And he has his paper ready to get, turn in. And I wondered what he had in his. So I peeked. And he had the letter C in that block. So I thought, well, I still had my little stubby pencil. 
that we'd filled the form out with. There were no ballpoint pens back in those days, you know. Oh, and if, if you had a pen, you had to dink it in, you know, duck it in a well and then write two or three words and then dip it again and it was a terrible thing. But uh, I had my stubby pencil, so I wrote letter C in mine. I became a Catholic right there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it. <laughs> God works in mysterious ways. Yes, sometimes. he does. <laughs> And when I got to boot camp, I had to go to mass. <laughs> Couldn't understand a word anybody said. <laughs> well, Woody, we better get you to the war here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you remember being shipped overseas? I do. Uh, when we left the Continental Embassy of the United States, <clears throat> uh, we were told, once we got aboard ship, that every letter that we wrote had to be left unsealed so that a censoring officer could read our letter to see if we're giving away some secrets to the enemy. And didn't know any, but uh, anyway, you had to leave the letter unsealed. And uh, when we shipped out, we went from California to New Caledonia. And uh, it was a replacement center where they were shipping the Marines in then designating where they would go from there to fill in the divisions, the other, the Marine divisions that had lost casualties or uh, people killed and that sort of thing, to fill in those vacant spots. And uh, that's why it was called a replacement center at New Caledonia. So we're there for, for a month or so, and then they shipped us to Guadalcanal. Uh, before I left the States, uh, I was engaged to the most beautiful woman in the world, as far as I was concerned. And uh, I wrote her a letter and I said, uh, we are going, I knew we were being shipped out. I wrote her a letter and I just told her that I have a way that I'm going to put in my letter that you can tell where I am when I'm overseas. They'd already told us that you, you know, you don't say where you are, what you're doing or any of that. And I told her that each paragraph in the letter, I would start with the letter, the first letter of the place, you know, and then follow through. Each paragraph would spell out the beginning, first letter in every paragraph would spell out where I am. So when, when I got to New Caledonia, I had to write the letter. Well, it was a big <laughs> catalog. <laughs> It's a long letter now. Long letter, you know. And I thought that was bad. Then I shipped out of there and went to Guadalcanal and I had to do it again. <laughs> but uh, one of the letters that I, <laughs> that, uh, I wrote, the censoring officer had written at the bottom of the letter, not saying it to me, but saying it to her, to my fiancé, girlfriend, tell Mr. Williams not to use code in his letters. <laughs> <laughs> I got caught, but they didn't do it. <laughs> They'd seen it all before. That's right. <laughs> okay. I know that your first combat experience, I believe, is at Guam. Correct. And then was Iwo Jima was the second? Yes. And in the interest of time here, I'd like to have you tell us about Iwo Jima and going into the beach at Iwo Jima. Okay. Uh, on the way from Guam to Iwo Jima, aboard ship, we were told, well, they brought out a board that they'd drawn the image or outline of the Iwo Jima Island. And <clears throat> uh, look, it, they said it looked like a pork chop. It did look a little bit like a pork chop. But uh, they were briefing us that this was Mount Suribachi and this is the beach area where the Marines were going to land and that type of information. <clears throat> and that we probably, as a division, would probably never get off ship. Uh, we were just a reserve unit in case they would need more Marines. <clears throat> what unit were you in? I was in the 3rd Marine Division. The 4th and 5th Divisions, which were 40,000 Marines, were to go first. They were, the, they were to take the island. And we were sitting out here in, in the ocean, not even close enough to see what's going on or hear anything or nothing. And uh, they're still thinking it would last three to five days max. Because 
We had just taken Guam that was something like 19 miles from one coastline to the other coastline and jungle and all that kind of thing. And here's this little piece of rock that's only two and a half miles wide and five miles long. They didn't dream they would ever have to have more than 40,000 Marines to take that thing, you know. So we're sitting out there <clears throat> not knowing what's going on and getting no briefing. We're just on a ship. And the first night after the first day when they lost so many the first day when they were pinned on the beach and no protection and all that, uh, they announced over the speaker we would get off at uh, 0500 and we're going ashore. So uh, we got off, went down the rope ladders into Higgins boats, went out to a rendezvous area, and they would put so many Higgins boats in a circle, just run around, 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 around. Uh, the waves at that time in that area were running uh, 10 to 12 feet. And that Higgins boat was just like a cork. You know, it was just constantly going one way or the other. And uh, we got into the circle and just kept going around and around and around. Uh, the waves were so heavy that they were splashing into the Higgins boat. Of course, the Higgins boat had a bilge pump on it. It was supposed to pump all the water out, but there was more water coming in than what it could take care of, so there was water sloshing back and forth all the time. They couldn't, there were 35 or 36 of us on the Higgins boat, and everybody couldn't sit down at the same time. So those, those that could sit with enough room, uh, they would, and then the other would stand around the edge. And then every once in a while, the gunnery sergeant who was in charge of the, our boat would say, okay, change. So those sitting would have to stand and those standing would have to sit. And uh, I'd never been seasick before, but uh, I got seasick that day. Uh, I was never quite sure whether it was the bouncing of the boat or somebody puked on me because everybody was including me and, but the beach area they had not been able to get off of the beach the fourth and fifth division was still pinned to that beach so uh, they took us back put us aboard ship again for the next for that night off again the next morning and that day we got in just before noon when the they finally broke loose from the beach and got up around Suribachi that gave us room to get in. And uh, <clears throat> hitting the, or landing on the beach, uh, visions that will never go away. Uh, we had no place to uh, place our, our dead. We, there was no land on which to do anything with because it was so full of gear and wrecked with vehicles and blowing up everything else. Uh, they had rolled them into ponchos. Everybody had a poncho to try to keep the rain off of you. And uh, we'd, drop our, we'd wrap our bedroll into our blanket into the poncho and put it on our pack, strap it to our pack. And when we hit the beach, uh, the ramp went down, we ran out and here are just stacks of bodies uh, because we had no place to put them, no way to get them. The ships couldn't take care of them. There were too many. They had no place to put them. And that vision will never, ever go away. I can't imagine what's going through your mind seeing all of that, being there in Iwo Jima, having to wait all that time before you even got to the island in the first place. Well, I think I was so scared uh, anybody that says they're not scared when somebody's shooting at them is not very smart. And I was scared as long as, it, as well as everybody else. But uh, when we got to the first airfield, uh, we were at the edge, and our job was to cross the airfield and become the point for the operation. The 3rd Marine Division was to take the point and... Uh, the fifth was on our left and the fourth was on our right and there to take the areas next to the shorelines uh, around the island. And uh, that's where I was when the flag went up on Mount Suribachi, right, right at the edge of the airfield. <clears throat> I didn't see the flag go up. Uh, the Marines around me all of a sudden 
began saying something, yelling about a flag, and some of them had jumped up and firing their weapons into the air. And I see and hear this, absolutely amazed or certainly didn't understand what they were doing and what was going on. But when I finally came, came to enough to realize they were doing they were celebrating something, and I turned and looked, and I saw old glory on Mount Suribachi for the first time, but it was already up flying. Uh, when we went across the airfield, we had no protection, so we lost most of our people. Uh, just as a statistic, when we hit the beach, we had 275 people in our country, I mean in our company, 275 people in our company, and on March the 5th, we were down to 17. Uh, as we would try to break through the pillboxes, they had all the protection because they're in a confined area. We're in an open area, jumping up, trying to run forward. And of course, they would just mow us down. And my commanding officer had lost all of his officers except two, and all of his uh, platoon leaders and, and uh, gunnery sergeants and sergeants and squad leaders, they were, they were gone. And we were very chaotic. We had no, no organization actually at all, except the few people around the commanding officer. And uh, we were trying to break through a line of pillboxes that had been built to protect the airfield. So that's when he called for a meeting of the NCOs that were left in the company. I'm a corporal. And as a corporal, I was not classified as an NCO had to be sergeant or better to be an NCO. So I wasn't going to go. The call didn't affect me. But uh, my first sergeant told me that I had to go, that he wanted me there. So we gathered in a great big shell crater that, uh, that had been blown out, and we could get below ground in that shell crater so that we at least wouldn't be shot at with grazing fire. And uh, he was looking for ideas and trying to figure out what are we going to do from here because there's not very many of us left. And that's when he asked me if I could use a flamethrower to uh, eliminate some of the pillboxes. When I hit the beach, or when we landed on the beach, uh, I had six individuals that were in my little unit, special weapons unit, that were flamethrower demolition operators. And uh, <clears throat> I had them assigned to each of the companies, A, B, and C company. I had two guys with each unit. Well, by that day, uh, the 23rd, we'd only been there three days, uh, they were gone. I didn't have any left. I was the only flamethrower demolition guy in the company. So he asked me if I thought I could do something about some of the flamethrowers, I mean some of the pillboxes with a flamethrower. And uh, that was my job. Uh, I have no idea what I said in response to him. Uh, some of the other guys said later that my response was, well, I'll try. So he gave me four Marines to uh, support me, protect me. And uh, <clears throat> two of them I knew because they were in my squad. The other two, I have no idea who they were or where they came from. I didn't know them, they were just Marines. But I said, they were POCs and privates, so they gotta go. I just said, come with me, and I put them in position to shoot at the pillboxes while I'm trying to get to the pillbox. And uh, put the flamethrower on and took off. Started trying to eliminate some of those. Was it an advantage to be a little bit shorter with that flamethrower on your Absolutely. back? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I can crawl faster than a tall guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, walk us through then the series of events that led to you receiving the Medal of Honor. All right. Uh, I put two of the Marines on my right and left and told them their instructions were that whatever pillbox I am approaching, you shoot at that aperture in the front. 
And these are interlocking pillboxes, are they not? They're close, but they're not touching. They're, there's distance between them. <clears throat> but they're interlocking fire, understood. Yes, they had crossfire. In other words, you, they could stick their weapons out this aperture in the front of the pillbox and shoot any direction they wanted to. All our target was, if we're approaching or shooting at the pillbox, is that eight-inch aperture or opening in the front of it. That's where they'd stick their rifles out and their machine guns, and they could work the whole field out here. And uh, that's why we were losing so many of our Marines. They had all the advantage. And <clears throat> so I told the, their instructions were that whatever pillbox I'm approaching, shoot at that hole, shoot at that aperture to keep them to being able, to keep them from being able to shoot at me. And I selected a guy by the name of Schlager to go with my first attempt. Uh, we had what we called a pole charge guy. And and they were designated as pole charge, pole charge people, pole charge marine. And uh, we made pole charges before we ever left for combat, took a two by two piece of wood, eight, about eight feet long, put a 12 inch plate on it, wooden plate, nailed it on, and then we would strap or tape on explosives on the end on that plate. That's why we called it a pole charge. And, uh, <clears throat> If you burn out a cave or a pillbox, then the pole charge guy's job was to run in and stick it in the cave or in the pillbox and set it off to make sure that the people in those confined areas are no longer there. Uh, I selected Slagger to go with me as my first pole charge guy. And uh, <clears throat> we went out to, I picked the first pillbox I was gonna try for, and we're down in a shell crater so I told him, we're going to go get this, we're going to take this first pillbox. Stay low, stay on the ground. Well, I got out of the pillbox, or out of the shell crater, crawling on my belly and crawling toward the pillbox. And just as I got out of it and crawling forward, he's following right behind me. Well, he didn't either hear me or didn't pay attention to what I told him because when he came out of the pillbox, he raised up kind of on his feet, bent over, and a bullet hit him right there. Went through the helmet, hit the liner inside, and went around and stopped back here. And when it did that, it hit him with such force that it threw him back in that hole that we just crawled out of. And uh, I heard the hit, the, the thing happen, and when I looked, he wasn't there, so he's back down in that hole. Uh, I went back to check on him. I crawled back in the hole to check on him, and he was, he was, he was alive. He was okay. Of course, the eyeballs weren't working right. <laughs> so I left him. I just left him in there because he's, he's done. He's not going to do any more. And so then I went to work by myself, and I didn't have a pole charge guy after that, but I uh, approached the first pillbox and got flame in it, eliminated the enemy with that one, uh, the sequence, I have no idea. Even after it happened, I had no idea. Uh, but the, uh, one of the other pillboxes that I approached, I was crawling on my belly up a ditch to get close enough. I had to get within 20, 20 to 25 yards max from the pillbox in order to get the flame in the pillbox. And I'm crawling up this ditch, and they're shooting at me with a Nambu which is like our 30 caliber. And <clears throat> their bullets are ricocheting off of the back of my flamethrower. And uh, fortunately, they went up instead of down, or I wouldn't be speaking with you. But uh, uh, I continued to crawl and got so in a position that they couldn't lower their weapon down anymore out of the aperture. But I saw this little curl of smoke on the top of the, coming out of the top of the pillbox. And uh, the logic told me that there must have a hole up there or there wouldn't be any smoke coming out of there. So uh, they had put sand on the pillboxes, covered them over, so they just looked like part of the territory. And uh, it was sloped off on the back, uh, the pillbox sand was. So I crawled up that, got up on top, and here's a hole 
a vent pipe. So they lived in those things. They cooked in there, they used charcoal, but they cooked in there and stayed in there. Some of them, they actually sealed the entrance so they couldn't get out. They're gonna die in there, you know. So uh, uh, I saw that hole and I stuck my flamethrower nozzle down that hole, eliminated the enemy within. And uh, during the course of four hours, time didn't mount, didn't have any meaning at all. Uh, course of four hours, I took one flamethrower with me when I first started, then I got five more somehow and eliminated seven of those, the enemy within seven of those pillboxes. And that gave us an opening <clears throat> so that we could get, break through their line. And once we got past that opening or those pillboxes, then we had the advantage because they can only shoot one way. I've got all kinds of questions, but I want to ask a couple in particular here. When you're going through all of this, were you thinking, it's not going to happen to me? It's not going to happen to me? Or it's just a matter of time? No, no. I wasn't thinking that way. <laughs> I never, first of all, I never let myself think that I wasn't going to make it. I always tried to keep the positive thought. If that thought even started to enter my mind, I'd eliminate it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to survive this thing. I've got to get back home. And that was the kind of thinking that I kept sticking in here. And <clears throat> but the amazing thing to me, and I've talked to psychologists, and they don't have the answer either, but uh, why can't I remember getting the other flamethrowers. Now the flamethrowers were back in the company CP, command post we called it. They were back there. We'd serviced probably 40 or 45 of those before we ever left for Iwo Jima. So we would have a big supply in case we needed them. And they were all ready to go. All I had to do was get them because they were all stored back in the company headquarters. But how did I get them? I've never been able to figure out how I got the, extra, the additional flamethrowers. I have said I am reasonably certain that no Marine back there ever said, hey, just wait, buddy, I'll bring you out one. <laughs> I don't think that ever happened. But how did I get it? It's just beyond my imagination or recollection. I have no recollection. The other thing I wanted to ask you you said there was four other people that were going with you that were drawing the fire to them and were firing into these slits, these, right. these portholes. Yes. How did they fare? Well, two of them survived and two of them sacrificed their life. The two that I did not know sacrificed their lives protecting mine. I didn't know that at the time. We got no report to say how many people were wounded or how many people were killed or nothing like that. Not that information was never fed to us at all. So I didn't even know that that had happened. I didn't know that they'd been killed. <clears throat> the, uh, the other two, as I said, it was uh, my squad people. Uh, I knew they survived because they got back to Guam with me, you know. But uh, it wasn't until years later that I learned that uh, those two had sacrificed their lives protecting mine. And up until I learned that, this medal was just a medal. I, I realized it was the highest award that you could receive and all that, and I knew that. But it didn't have its significance until I learned that two Marines had died protecting me. And when I learned that, it took on a completely different significance. And from that point forward, I said, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to them. I wear it in their honor, not mine. I was just doing a job for which the Marine Corps trained me to do. They did more than that. They sacrificed all they had. So I wear it in their honor. That's quite a burden. It is. 
I wanted to read the citation, not all the flowery words that always go along with the citation, but the important part, at least the part I think is important. Quick to volunteer his services when our tanks were maneuvering vainly in, to open and lane for the infantry through the network of reinforced concrete pillboxes. And my understanding is the tanks couldn't get any good traction on that dirt. Buried mines in black volcanic sand, Corporal Williams daringly went forward alone to attempt reduction of devastating machine gun fire from the unyielding positions. Covered only by four riflemen, he fought desperately for four hours under terrific enemy small arms fire and repeatedly returned to his own lines to prepare demolition charges and obtain serviced flamethrowers, struggling back frequently to the rear of the hostile emplacements to wipe out one position after another. On one occasion, he daringly mounted a pillbox to insert the nozzle of the flamethrower through the air vent, kill the occupants, and silence the gun. On another, he grimly charged enemy riflemen who attempted to stop him with bayonets and destroyed them with a burst of flame from his weapon. Do you remember that last part? I certainly do remember that very vividly, yes. So a rare occasion where the Japanese actually came out of the pillboxes? Yes. How often did you actually see Japanese soldiers? That's a difficult question to answer because of memory and, and at the time you're so uh, concentrating on what's going on that maybe you don't attempt to, to remember. So I really cannot give you an answer to that question. I don't know. I know that this action that we just described happened on the 23rd of February. Yes. The same day, as I understand, that the flag went up. That is true. And there was still combat for another two, three weeks, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I understand you were wounded. I was. Uh, I, uh, we, were, we were moving forward, and we'd gotten out of the sandy area. Now we're in rock area where the volcano had exploded and blown these rocks to the northern part of the island. The volcanic ash was around the Mount Suribachi itself, because the sand's not going to go very far. But when that thing exploded, or erupted as they call it, it would throw rocks half a mile or a mile away. I mean, it was a, a, unreal. And big stuff, huge rocks, it was just un unreal. Uh, once we got out of the sand area and into the rock area, <clears throat> we would move forward uh, individually. You're moving forward, running, finding, and you, we were told by the, those who already had been there, before you jump up and run, find out or determine where you're going to land. Just don't jump up and run, but pick your spot. Run to that particular spot. And uh, that's what I did. I jumped up and run toward a particular spot that I could see it was hollowed out in the ground a little bit, get a little protection. So uh, I got up to the spot, and instead of laying down on my belly, I scooted in on my, on my backside. <laughs> and, and I could get down in that little dugout place. Probably a shell had hit and, you know, dug it out. And uh, I could get in it all except my left leg. I couldn't get my left leg in there. There wasn't room for everything. And so my left leg is sticking up. And uh, I just no more than got there uh, into the hole, and a piece of shrapnel came in and hit me in the leg. And, <clears throat> of course, the first thing out of your mouth when, when you get hit like that is Corman. I've never quite understood the... Navy corpsman or the Army medic. What causes those people to do what they do has always been a mystery to me. Here's a guy that just got shot, and he calls for the medic or the corpsman, and the corpsman runs to the very same spot where he just got shot. <laughs> now, what kind of sense does that make? <laughs> You've got to be a very dedicated person to do that sort of thing. So I called for the corpsman, and of course he came to me <clears throat> and uh, cut my dungaree leg, pants leg off, <clears throat> and got his little forceps out and reached in there and pulled the 
pulled the uh, metal out, and then he took sulfur powder and put it all, that's all we had at that time, sure. put sulfur powder on it, and then took a pressure bandage and wrapped it around my leg to keep me from bleeding, and uh, then he tagged me, put a tag, he had to make a report, he has to make a report of every casualty that he takes care of. So he quickly filled out his report, showing where the wound was and mama name, and that's about all they showed, the, the date. And then he put uh, the tag on me, which is a medical tag. And he said, you gotta go back to, to uh, first aid station. And uh, I said, I'm not gonna go. He said, you gotta go. And we had been told, all Marines were, that if whatever that medic says or whatever that corpsman says, you are to do. He's, he's in charge. So if he tells you to do something, do it. You know. But I said, no, I'm not going to go. He says, you got to go because I put a tag on you. And I reached up and jerked the tag off, and I said, I don't have a tag on me. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you what he called me. <laughs> but... Uh, we continued. It, it, was, it wasn't so bad that I couldn't walk on it. And so I walked around like a West Virginia hillbilly for a few days. <laughs> One leg shorter than the other, you know. <laughs> but uh, kept on going. Well, we've gone past the limit of time I was given in the first place, but I can't help but ask a couple more questions. I want to hear the story about you receiving the award from President Truman. Well, there were 13 of us that day. The, the, all the awards of the 13 had already been approved. They were from Guam, Saipan, Iwo Jima. And <clears throat> there were seven Marines and six corpsmen, medic corpsmen, uh, Navy corpsmen. <clears throat> and of course, as you well know, uh, in the military, everything's alphabetical. W is almost last, Z is last. So they had all of us sitting in a row, alphabetically. And so uh, they would call your name, then you'd walk up to the president and stand there at attention while they read your citation of why you were receiving the Medal of Honor. Then a Navy guy would come over and give it to the president, and he's put the ribbon around your neck. That was the procedure. See? So I'm sitting there watching all this take place. Well, Jack Lucas was a 17-year-old Marine, the second youngest to ever receive it. Jack, of course, was the middle of the alphabet, as Lucas, as an L. So uh, when they called Jack up, he was only 17, had never seen a bashful day in his life, had a big voice. He wasn't very big himself, but he had a big voice. <clears throat> so the president had something that he said to every person. <clears throat> Changed <clears throat> Excuse me, he changed it around some, but <clears throat> Jack said he said to him, uh, when he, after he got the medal or the ribbon around his neck, he said, I'd rather have this medal than to be president of the United States. And Jack said in a great big loud voice, I'll trade you. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody was laughing and, you know, <laughs> I didn't know why they were laughing. I, I didn't know all that was going on. I'm still waiting on this time that I got to get up and walk up to the president. And so they finally get to me, and, and I walk up, and my body is quivering. I'm a country boy scared to death, and my body is quivering. It won't stand still. And, and I raise up on my toes to see if I could keep my body from quivering, and that didn't help. And I can remember rolling back on my heels thinking that would do it, and that didn't do it. But uh, he put the ribbon around my neck, and then he said to me the same words that he said to Jack. I'd rather have this medal than to be president of the United States. I was so scared, I couldn't even think what to say. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh, he was, an, of course, Truman was an old uh, artillery man, so, and knew, he had a good concept of what it was. But uh, the next real memorable thing happened was we had to go see the Commandant of the Marine Corps. Now, the President was bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> but to have, if you had to go see the Commandant of the Marine Corps as a, as a corporal... You must have really done something wrong. That's exactly right, you know. 
And here again, it's alphabetical, and I'm next to last, <clears throat> because there was one guy by the name of Zimmerman who was right behind me. And uh, uh, when I walked in his uh, office, the commandant's office, walked up to his desk, snapped to attention, he said something, and I was so scared I couldn't hear it, but then he said it again, and what he was saying is, at ease. <laughs> I finally realized when he said it the second time, that's what he said the first time. But uh, anyway, he said some words, and he was a Medal of Honor recipient himself from Guadalcanal, A.A. A. Vandegrift. And much of what he said I do not remember, but some of it I do very vividly. One of the things he said was, that medal does not belong to you. It belongs to all those Marines who did not get to come home. And then he used the word that we have lost to history. Don't ever do anything that would tarnish that medal. Which is the same as saying, don't ever do anything that would disgrace or bring something bad toward that metal. I remember those words very, very well. And that obligation that comes along with it then. Yes, sir. Now, early in our conversation, you talked about that moment when you're filling out paperwork and you had to fill that block in and you had to put down some kind of religion and it was just a big C. Yes. But I think there's something towards the tail end of your story that needs to be told as well. Well, remind me. <laughs> well, aren't you the chaplain for the Marine or for the Medal of Honor Association? Yes. Uh, uh, probably a lot of people in here have seen Hacksaw Ridge, the movie. Desmond Doss, conscientious objector, went in the army would not carry a weapon. And if you've seen Hacksaw Ridge, it's one of the most vivid, I believe, uh, illustrations of combat that, that I have seen. Desmond was the first chaplain of the Medal of Honor Society. <clears throat> and when, when he and I were, first got involved in this thing, there were almost 400 Medal of Honor recipients living. We even had Spanish-American War and and uh, World War I, and then, of course, World War II. <clears throat> but Desmond, during his combat, had so many explosions that it had blown his ears out. And he, he wore hearing aids for a while, and they didn't work. So they finally put the Glockner, is that the proper term? Cochlear implants? Yeah, cochlear cochlear implants on both sides of his, of his head, on the bones back here. And <clears throat> he could hear pretty well, but he was getting so much uh, vibration from these that it, he, to him it sounded like he was talking real loud when actually he was barely whispering. And he was the guy that was holding all of our memorial services every year for those that we would lose in the course of a year. And <clears throat> so uh, he and his little wife, she weighed about 80 pounds, they would set up the memorial service, put in the chairs and get everything ready. And uh, I think we were in Branston, Missouri, and they were doing that. And I walked in and asked if I could help them because just the two of them doing this thing, setting up all these chairs and getting things ready. <clears throat> so I began working with Desmond to help him get the memorial services set up, pass out bulletins and, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, <clears throat> so Desmond and I became rather close as a result of that. And finally, we were in a, a Hawaii at a convention, and Desmond was setting up the memorial service. And... Uh, he and I were sitting waiting for the service to start or waiting for the time to start. And he said to me, uh, he said, I can't do this anymore. He said, I know I'm not reaching these people. I'm not communicating with them. And that's true. There were times when he would get so low in his voice, you couldn't hear what he was saying. So <clears throat> he said, how about you taking this over? And I said, well, if 
if the president wants me to do it, I'll, I'll be glad to, you know, take the job. So he went and talked to the, <clears throat> to the president of the society and said that he wanted to resign and asked if he would, uh, if I could replace him. And <clears throat> they didn't have anybody else. I think they were desperate. <laughs> So <laughs> they let me do it. I did it for 35 years. And wow. Finally, I reached that point where Desmond was, and I turned it over to Gary Biker from Rochester, New York. <laughs> so now Gary's got the headaches. <laughs> well, you might want to have a sip of water here. I yeah, got, I got oh, one. you got some, do you? Yeah. Just uh, one more question, then we'll turn it over to the audience. I'm sure you are constantly told that you're a hero. What's your reaction to that? My belief has always been, and I keep saying this over and over, the heroes never got to come home. They are the heroes because they sacrificed their lives so I could be who I am, have all the privileges that I have as a free American. And had they not been in a position or willing to take that oath, where they said, in effect, <clears throat> you may take my life, but you cannot take my freedom. So I'm no hero. They are. I'm sure those heroes are proud of you. Well, so thank, thank you. you very much, Woody. Thank you. What I'd like to do, just for a couple minutes, because we are seriously over on time, but I did want to give the, if you're okay with this, sure. fielding some questions from the audience. So who would like to go first? Right up front here. The question for the audience is asking you when and where you found out that you were going to get this Medal of Honor and yeah. what the family's reaction of actually having the opportunity to go to the White House and, and watch you receive it. Well, <clears throat> I was on the island of Guam. And when we came back from Iwo Jima, we began a new training uh, series of how do you fight in a street. All the training we'd received was jungle warfare type training. When we came back, they had built up false fronted buildings as, as if it was a street situation. And they began teaching us how do you approach a city in, in formation? How do you approach a house? or go through a door or a window, so that when we get to a city, we were going to a city, when we get to the city, this is how combat is done in a city compared to what was done in jungle. <clears throat> we had no idea where we were going to go or when we were going to go. I have since learned that on November the 2nd, 1945, my division and two other Marine divisions were scheduled to leave and take Kyushu, the island of Kyushu in Japan. That's why they were training us for uh, street warfare. We were also learned later that they had armed every man and woman with some kind of a weapon, even children from 14 up. They gave them some kind of a weapon, a machete, a sharpened stick, or anything in the world that could cause injury or death so that when the Marines came and they anticipated we were, uh, they would have some weapon to fight with, which would have been a terrible thing because we would have had to, in order to win, we would have had to eliminate those who were trying to keep us from taking the island. So... Uh, I was, I was called, called to the office of my first sergeant, <clears throat> and he said, uh, they just called me and told me that you've got to go to the general's tent. And uh, my general was Graves B. Erskine at that time. I would never even been close to him. And I'm a corporal. What am I doing with a general? But uh, I said, what for? And he said, and I repeat his words, hell, I don't know. <laughs> Just go get your khaki on. We only had two uniforms. We had dungarees and one set of khaki. And we had to save our khaki so that every Saturday morning when we had our inspection, 
we would have to have our khakis ironed. We had one iron to a tent. We'd iron our khakis and get them all ship shaped so they wouldn't be wrinkled. And uh, then we would have our inspection. So he said, go get your khakis ironed and then get back here as soon as you can. So I went back and grabbed my iron and I ironed out the wrinkles because we had to put them in a sea bag. We didn't have any closets or anything like that. You roll them up and stick them in a sea bag. And uh, got all the wrinkles out the best I could and went back to the first sergeant's office and, and a jeep came along with the driver and picked me up to take me to the general's tent. Now, I'm a corporal. What am I going to the general? What have I done wrong? I was almost as scared. I think maybe I was even more scared then than I was with the president. But they put me in that jeep and took me to the general's tent, and I'd never seen a general's tent. We didn't have any door on our tent. He had a door on his tent. We didn't have any rug on our floor, and he had a rug on his floor. So when I got there, there was a colonel standing out in front of the tent, Marine colonel, and uh, he briefed me as to how I'm to work or how I'm to do when I walk into the general's tent. He said, uh, you know, put your cover in your hand like this. Make sure the emblem is showing. <laughs> and walk in, stand at attention until the general tells you what to do. So I walked in, walked up to the general's tent, and stood there, and he gave me at ease and uh, <clears throat> congratulated me that I'm going back home. If he mentioned the Medal of Honor, it didn't mean anything. I'd never heard of it. So it was a, so a words I had no familiarity with at all. It's like I've used this example several times. Ten years ago, if you'd have said to me, gigabyte. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so what? <laughs> so if he used the word uh, Medal of Honor, it didn't mean anything because I'd never heard of it. But anyway, he said, you're going back to the, you're being called back to the States, you're going to the White House. I didn't care where, what I'm going to do, I get to go home. That, that's the thing that stuck in my mind. I get to go home. <clears throat> so uh, he gave me an order, uh, I mean an envelope that had my orders in it. It was a great big brown envelope, about eight inches square, I mean eight inches uh, wide, and about a foot long, and uh, he gave me that envelope and he said, these are your orders. Then dismiss me. And I went back out and when I walked out, the colonel's still standing there, and uh, he said, uh, the colonel said to me, uh, those orders, he said, see that, see that seal on the back? Well, I hadn't, but on the back was a piece of wax and had the letter E in it. That was the general seal. He said, if you break that seal, that's a court-martial offense. So, I ain't going to break that seal. <laughs> <laughs> but um, turn those orders in when you get to Hawaii. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know where Hawaii was. So, anyway, went back, got my gear put together in my sea bag, and they took me to a little old airport that wasn't even paved. It was just a dirt airfield and uh, put me on a plane, about a six-passenger plane, and we're to fly to Hawaii. And when we get to Hawaii, I turn my orders in, and uh, at that time, we were rescuing the POWs from Japan. They were bringing them in there by the plane load, and they had first priority on any seat on any aircraft going to the States. So it was days before they could get me on an airplane. But in the meantime, they sent me to a Navy base so, they, so I could eat and feed me and sleep me. They sent me to a Navy base just outside or on the outskirts of Honolulu, and uh, they lost me. I was out there for seven days. <laughs> Finally, I, I thought, hey, I'm supposed to be going back to the States. I did know that I had an October 3rd date that I was supposed to be in Washington, D.C. I knew that. And if I'm not going to be there on October 3rd, I'm the guy that's in trouble. So finally, I hitched a ride back downtown to the headquarters of the Marine Corps and walk in and, and ask for the first sergeant. 
<laughs> I'll never forget his words. He was back in his office and he came walking up the hallway and looked at me and he said, what in the hell are you doing here? <laughs> like he didn't know. But uh, <clears throat> they finally got me on a plane. <clears throat> One of those memories that will never, never go away. There were, uh, it was a 50 seat plane. I think of DC-3, if I remember correctly. And it was all lit up, big lights shining on it. I'm the last guy to get on the plane. And when I get on, the first seat uh, on the right side of the airplane was vacant. They were all POWs. They were people that had weighed 170, 80 pounds, and now they weighed 80 and 90 pounds. They looked almost like skeletons. Their eyes were sunken in, their cheeks were sunken in, bones sticking out wherever. That some of them had been a Japanese prisoner of war for four and five years. But they were the happiest group of people I have ever seen in my life. We sat down in the plane, and it took off. And the POW sitting beside me, I was asking him some questions. I was curious about being a POW. And he was telling me they got one bowl of soup a day, might have a piece of cabbage in it, but maybe it didn't. They punished you for anything that you would try to do or didn't do. But one of the statements he made was, you'll never know what freedom really is until you have lost it. Those words have stuck with me from that day on and how true that is. They dropped me off in San Francisco, and all of those POWs were being flown to Letterman General Hospital in Michigan to re-nourish them and treat them and heal them before they were released uh, from the military. I took my mother and my girlfriend. We didn't know the word fiancé back in those days. That gigabyte, we didn't know that. <laughs> I took my girlfriend and uh, my mother with me. Uh, my brothers, two brothers in the army, had been drafted before I went in. They were still in Germany. And uh, <clears throat> so my mother, the only place she'd ever been in her life was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania out of West Virginia, so it was just absolutely enthralling to her. It was beyond her, her imagination. She just couldn't imagine any of this hoopla going on. <clears throat> Had no understanding at all of why this was all happening to her boy. Absolutely none. And words that we were using had absolutely no meaning to her at all. Sergeant didn't mean anything to her. You know, that, that didn't have any meaning because she never heard the words, you know. Uh, Ruby, my eventual wife, I married her pretty quickly. Uh, she had a great understanding of what was going on because of, she was only 22 years old. But... Uh, uh, here again, much of the military, having no experience with military or understanding military, it still didn't have a great deal of meaning to her. The meaning came after we got married, and then she became involved in all the functions that a Medal of Honor recipient gets involved in. Because the day the, this medal is pinned around their neck, their life changes. Mm -hmm. They no longer can be the same person they were the day before. They take on a completely new life because of the demand of public and the, the 
honor that they have received. It changes their whole life. And just ask any one of them and they'll tell you that the day they received the medal, their life changed to something they never dreamed they would ever be. I think we've got time for just one more question. If we, if somebody would like to, and I see one right over here. Yes, sir. The question was the girlfriend that you ended up marrying, was that the same one that you mentioned early in your story? Yes, absolutely. And I think there's a story somewhere in here about a ring too. Yes. We were married for 63 years. How she put up with me for 63 years, she was a strong woman. But uh, Vernon Waters was uh, my assistant flamethrower operator. Vernon was 6'6", six, six, from uh, Freud. Isn't that a medical term of some kind? Uh, uh, Montana. <clears throat> and uh, when, just before I left for the Marine Corps, um, my girlfriend, Ruby, went to the Murphy's 10 Cent Store. Most of you people never heard of Murphy's 10 Cent Store. But every city back in my day had a Murphy's 10 Cent Store like Walmart today. But she got a little ring and brought it home and on our next date, she gave it to me. And her name being Ruby, she got this little ring with a, a ruby in it about the size of a pinhead. <laughs> oh, it was an expensive thing. I think she paid a quarter for it. <laughs> but uh, anyway, she gave me that ring and she told me, every time you look at that ruby, you think of me. Now, I know nothing about psychology, but if I even thought about getting a date, I know I can't do it. Uh, you know. <laughs> that thing had a, I don't know what it had an effect on me, but it did. But anyway, <clears throat> Vernon, when he left for the, for the Marine Corps, his daddy gave him a ring. And it was a big thing. Of course, he had big fingers, so <clears throat> he had a big ring. And it was a kind of a square ring and it had a scene in it of a lake with trees around it. Beautiful stone of some kind. And uh, so Vernon rode, wrote, uh, wore that ring on that finger. Well, my day, men didn't do that. You didn't wear a ring except on this finger, period. But he had to wear it here because these fingers were grown together on both hands. In fact, all the men in the family, that's how they were. <clears throat> so... Uh, we were sitting in a tent one day and probably talking about home and all that sort of thing. And we, one or the other of us said to the other one, you know, if anything happens to me, I want you to get this ring, I said, back to, back to my girlfriend, Ruby. And he said, well, if anything happens to me, I want you to get this ring back to Dad. And we shook hands. That's a promise. Never dreaming that either one of us would ever get killed. On Iwo Jima, a mortar hit him in the top of the helmet and killed him instantly. I ran to him. It was just shortly after I was wounded. I ran to him, and of course, he spread out on the ground and already gone. And I see this ring. And that pact, that promise that we made sitting in that tent on Guam came back to me and we had been told over and over, you never take anything off the body of a dead Marie. It was a court martial offense if you were caught. But we made that pack. I tried to pull the ring off, couldn't get it, so I spit on it. And I finally worked it off with my spit. And that ring had been on there for two and a half years in the Pacific. It was white as a sheet of paper. So anybody looking at his hand would know somebody took something off of that finger because of the whiteness. So I grabbed sand and rubbed on it. That didn't do anything. So I spit in my hand and put some sand in it and made it kind of a mud and rubbed that on it. At least it dulled it. I stuck the ring in my pocket and went on. Nobody ever said anything to me and I didn't say anything to anybody else. I, when we got back to Guam, I wrote to folks and told them that I had his ring. But I was not going to put it in the mail. I will bring it home. When I get home, I'll bring it to you. 
And uh, so I kept it. So when I got home, after my wife and I were married, we were figuring out, we had no money. How are we going to get to Floyd, Montana? We weren't sure. Finally, we decided, well, we'll take a bus. We'll ride a bus to Floyd, Montana. <clears throat> and a friend who had an automobile dealer, dealership had Dodge vehicles, and he had an old 1942 Dodge red convertible. And uh, he and I became close friends because he let me park in his garage free. <laughs> so we became pretty close friends, and, and I had mentioned to him this ring situation, and how, how am I going to get this ring? So he said, well, why don't you take my old Dodge, take my convertible? Okay. Well, this is an old cloth top. It leaked like a sieve. It rained, you rained inside as well as outside, you know. But we got in that old 42 Dodge, ball-headed tires, had a spare that didn't have a, it was as slick as that table right there. It didn't have a thread <laughs> on it as a spare tire. But we only had two flat tires going to Montana. I thought we did pretty good. <laughs> and we drove all the way to Montana and way north just before you crossed into Canada, where that little town is. It was a little wheat town. They just raised wheat. Uh, we delivered that ring to Mr. and Mrs. Waters. You would have thought, I thought, it was the most valuable thing that they could possess other than their own son. But I lived up to my promise. Had to. Woody, you have more than answered the call of duty. You've gone way beyond the call of duty today because we're at least a half an hour beyond what we had <laughs> promised to do in the first place. I'm going to give you an opportunity. This isn't a question, but an opportunity I think you might appreciate just to spend a couple minutes telling us about your foundation. Okay. <clears throat> Most of you have heard the term gold star mother. Ghost Our Mother started in California, World War I. That most mothers, at that point in time, they weren't uh, particularly drafting fathers back then. They were mostly sons. So <clears throat> the mothers in California, some city, I don't remember which one, decided that they were first going to get a Blue Star flag, hang it in their window to say that this home has somebody serving in the war so that the people in the community would know that that was true. Then if that individual lost their life in the war, they would replace, they would just hang the gold star over the blue, indicating that one is not coming home. They did that all during World War I, then we quit. Didn't do it during any of the peacetime period, even though we lost some people in the armed forces during peacetime, we didn't use this. Came back into play again in World War II. My mother had three of these blue stars, uh, flags, hanging in her window because I wasn't in the Pacific, two brothers were in Europe. Many homes had five and six of these blue stars hanging in their window. That eventually they made a flag which would have more than one blue star on it. And <clears throat> we did that during World War II, and then we quit again. So gold star mothers or gold star families were never in any way recognized for their sacrifice. Some communities around the country, uh, after, particularly after Korea, and during the early part of Vietnam, began putting flags in their windows. And <clears throat> but nobody had ever mentioned or said anything about the Gold Star dad or Gold Star family, grandpa, grandma, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles. Nobody had ever mentioned any of those people. The country as a whole had never in any way showed any 
type of memorial or recognition of those families. For about 15 years, I attempted to get a Gold Star Mother's Memorial built in Washington, D.C. I couldn't even get my own congressional people to support me. They wouldn't do it. Their excuse was that if we support that, then there's going to be other things that people are going to ask us to support. So we, we can't do one without doing all the others, so we just can't do it. Finally, I gave up. The, we're just not going to make it. <clears throat> but Ghost Our Mothers were still reasonably recognized, and they were beginning to get a little bit of organization about themselves, get groups together mothers together, and uh, we have a memorial on our capital grounds in West Virginia that has 11,434 names on it of West Virginians who have sacrificed their lives in the armed forces. We had never done anything to honor those families or even recognize the fact other than put their name on a memorial. I was speaking to a group of senior citizens Parkersburg, West Virginia, and I asked the question, do we have gold star mothers in the group? And several hands went up. So I'm going to ask the question here, expand it to the point that if anyone in this audience had a relative of any degree on your side of the family that during the history of America from the time we became a nation to the present day, who sacrificed their life, regardless of how that may have happened, but it happened while they were in the armed forces of our country, if any of you have had a relative like that, would you please just raise your hand? How many do we have in here? Quite a number. Thank you very much. Let the rest of us thank them, because they made a sacrifice. There's an empty chair at the table for them. So after asking that question and, and recognizing the Gold Star Mothers, I finished my speech. I'm ready to leave, and one man stayed. And after it was all over, he walked up to me, and tears were coming down his cheeks. And the only thing he said to me was, Dad's cry, too. I asked him if he would share with me what happened, and he agreed. He said that he was the only son of his mother and father. They just had one child. He was it. Mom and dad's already dead. He and his wife had one child, his, his son, and he had already volunteered for the Army. He was ready to go to Fort Leonard Wood. Mother had had cancer for quite some time, and she died. And he could have gotten out of it, but he said, no, I still want to serve my country. So he went, ended up in Afghanistan, and there sacrificed his life. Dad was alone. Dad had no relatives. He didn't know any Gold Star family members in his community, and Parkersburg's a pretty good-sized town. And that knock that nobody wants came upon the door to tell him that his son had gotten killed in Afghanistan. And he said, I had nobody to talk to, nobody to share with. Why I hadn't, in all the effort that I'd made, ever thought of Gold Star Dad. And I hadn't. On the way back home that afternoon, I decided we've got to do something in West Virginia. I'm not thinking of anywhere else. I'm not thinking of Ohio or Illinois or Pennsylvania or anyplace else. I'm thinking of West Virginia. But we've got to do something in West Virginia to at least honor the families of those on that wall. So I was on a committee and we we're working on veteran cemetery and I introduced the idea to this group. We need to do something to honor those families. And of course, everybody said, well, we think that's a great idea. What do you want to do? <laughs> and so 
They told me, well, drink, you know, come up with something and bring it back to the next meeting and we'll see what we can do. And so that's where the design came from. I went home and began working on different ideas and finally ended up with the one that, that we are using. And we did the very first one in 2013 in the state of West Virginia to honor our loss, thinking that's it. And probably if it wasn't for computers and the internet, it would still be it. But it got on the internet. The second one was seen by the son of a father who had lost his life in Afghan or in uh, um, Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, Vietnam. thank you. <clears throat> in Vietnam. And he said, we must do something in our community to honor those Gold Star families. So he did number two. Number three was done by a boys' school, 250-member boys' school down in Clearwater, Florida, for those, that community. And then it just began to roll. Today, we have dedicated 59 in the United States, from Hawaii to California, New York to Florida, and all over. West Virginia right now has seven, eight, nine, and ten are coming. Ohio has ten. Communities all over this country, the citizens in these communities are realizing for the first time that we have Gold Star family members, people who have sacrificed one of their own for all of us living in our community and we have never even recognized them. Gold Star families are coming together for the first time in history. They now are becoming acquainted with each other. They're, they have the same grief that they share with each other. That's never happened before. And yet with all of that effort, we're in 44 states right now that have done something. We've got 63 other projects in process somewhere in this country right now that's being worked on. Yet, we do not have the first thing in the capital of this great country where we have 1,100 monuments and memorials but we do not have one iota of an indication for Gold Star families who made it possible for the rest of us to live in the greatest country on earth. I do not understand that. We're working on it. We've been working on it for a long, long time but it hasn't happened yet. I hope before God says, hey buddy, come up here and live with me for a while. I hope before that happens that we will see a large memorial of some nature in our nation's capital, which should be the largest in the country. Woody, I suspect that, like myself, a lot of people in the audience here could sit here and listen to you all night long, but that would be unfair to you. <laughs> We're already way beyond the time frame that I was allotted in the first place, but you have been an inspiration to me this evening. These stories are amazing to hear, and you have certainly lived up to the obligation that you received when you got that medal. All right, thank so you thank you very much. much. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you very much.